Uh, via telephone, we have Joe, Joey Torts for Ready. Good morning, Joseph. Good morning. You know, uh, Summer confirmed on our Facebook feed yesterday that she, that orange shirt went to Goodwill, probably with a lot of other old underwear that Jason was uh, harboring. <laughs> I don't think she said anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's be honest though. Let's pick on Jason this morning. This is feels good already. <laughs> as as men, the average age of a man's underpants is probably right up there with the age of his car or or, or, or older. <laughs> we're, we're just not big underwear shoppers. <laughs> I'm sure as Jason knows it takes getting married to uh to get to the point where you throw some of that stuff out. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, Joe, I did just go through the closet. So Summer says the other day, I'm run out, I run out of hangers as I'm trying to hang out my clothes. And she says, well, you need to get rid of about 10 shirts in there. So it took me about 10 minutes, and I think I got rid of about 40 shirts and about 20 pair of jeans that I wish would still fit, but don't. So. 40 shirts? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a lot of shirts. Yeah, and I don't wear Who knows the last time I wore them? That include T-shirts, or are you just talking dress shirts? No, I think it, it's more like polos and just shirts yeah. that I don't wear. I mean, some of them are dress shirts, sure, and I just they're between, not in style anymore. And between work, it's like Bill's wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> I, just knew, I just knew that was coming. What that? I missed that. I was, what did he say? It's better you didn't hear it, Bill. It's just better you didn't hear it. How about this? When Jason talks the rest of this morning, I'm just going to turn your headphones off because I think you're marked now. You started off with you disappointed me, Jason. Well, He's yeah, just been pounding back but, with lefts but, and rights. But it was a lead-in saying something nice about it. Nah, I'm not sure you're supposed to lead in with a, with a you disappointed me to set up your, something nice. Uh, Joe, let's get into it here with the Supreme Court yesterday. Some big decisions uh, as the court wraps up its uh, session here. And more will come today, including, we understand, student loan forgiveness and whatever, but of course, the big one with uh, affirmative action. Can you give us the summary decision there, a summary of it? Oh, yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, that's going to be my lead-off topic this morning uh, for the panel discussion. But, uh, yeah, in the case of Students for Fairness versus North Carolina University and Harvard College, the Supreme Court yesterday released a momentous decision turning back over well about 50 years worth of legal precedent in finding that affirmative action otherwise known as racial preferences in terms of the admissions work that is done by colleges and universities is no longer favored in the law uh, justice roberts was the author of the opinion and he has long been known to be against the concept of affirmative action all the way back to the years when he served in the Reagan and Bush 41 administrations as uh, counsel to the president and also as the assistant solicitor general for the United States. He has made it clear that he did not feel that uh, racial preferences granted in the admissions process for these uh, in higher education were constitutionally valid. And he had his shot yesterday to take that issue on directly, and he did. In authoring the opinion, it was a 6-3 vote. Of course, the three so-called liberal justices of the Supreme Court filed dissents. And I believe having, uh, and I didn't read the entire opinion because this is the time of year when it's like a fire hose of <laughs> legal cases that come out from the Supreme Court because they clear the uh, deck before they go on their summer recess. So that's why a lot of opinions are, are coming out right now. But uh, I had a chance to skim some parts of Robert's opinion and some of the dissents, and I will say that they are very much worth reading. Uh, I, specifically, uh, of course, the uh, dis, uh, majority opinion, but also Clarence Thomas's concurrence since he comes at this issue from a from an interesting perspective, uh, admittedly uh, he he does he does admit he is the beneficiary of affirmative action policies in his life, but uh, he, he does speak critically of the concept. And then Justice Jackson, the newest justice on the Supreme Court, with a uh, pretty strongly worded dissent, uh, going back through the history of affirmative action, where we were as a country, where we are today, and why she feels this is uh, detrimental 
to a country that still strives for racial diversity. So uh, all in all, a momentous decision and one that will certainly affect our colleges and universities and perhaps other aspects of life in the future. Joe, the uh, decision initially in, in which uh, affirmative action uh, became a policy or a plan in the United States was initially instituted and upheld under what grounds? Well, it, it, this goes back to, and it's important to understand the history, Rob, and I, it's a good question you asked, because we, we have to look at these Supreme Court cases in context. You and I, Rob, were in high school when the Bakke decision in 1978 was, this, uh, was released by the Supreme Court, and that involved the California University system. Bakke sued, claiming that as a white male, uh, with racial preferences being granted in the admissions process, he was unlawfully discriminated against under the 14th Amendment and under Title VII law. And we remember that the 14th Amendment was passed in the pro-Civil War era as a means of granting to the blacks in this country equal protection under the law. And that's stated in the 14th Amendment and understanding that that applies to the states. So privately, you know, the 14th Amendment does not affect private affairs, private organizations or groups, but it affects states and state-related institutions. And, of, of course, universities and, and colleges are state-related if they receive federal funds, and, and almost all of them do. So in 78, to affect the purposes of a 14th Amendment, which granted equal protection under the law, it was decided by a Supreme Court, including the conservative justice on the Supreme Court, that to achieve racial diversity, we were going to have to address the sins of the past and grant affirmatively some favoritism towards minorities, uh, whether they be racial or ethnic, in order that they could achieve uh, like whites have achieved for decades. And these preferences were upheld consistently since 1978 and as late as the early 2000s in the uh, Grutter decision, Grutter versus Bollinger, I think of the 2003 decision, the Bakke case was affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Interestingly, in that case, Rob, Sandra Day O'Connor, who uh, was the first female justice on the Supreme Court, uh, conservative by all accounts, indicated in her of concurrence upholding affirmative action that at some point in time, this uh, process, this principle would have to die a natural death because the country would, in essence, have gone through decades of attempting to achieve racial diversity. Her hope was that we would get there and that this kind of law, which grants preferences based on race, would eventually go away. I think she predicted 25 years. And interestingly enough, it's been uh, about 22, 23 years since that decision and that pronouncement by Sandra Day O'Connor. So that's where we've been as a country, uh, that racial preferences and affirmative action were, were really designed to grant preferences. And in recognition of the fact that in the 100-yard dash of life, we all don't start with the same quality of shoes or clothing or training to complete that, that race. So uh, that's where the country's been, and it's now this Supreme Court which has decided that uh, enough is enough. Uh, in order to be uh, a country that's true to its principles, we should not grant racial preferences to anybody in any walk of life. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Joe. Uh, Morning. Uh, Johnson and the Great Society tried to address a lot of these inequities uh, and put things in statute. Has there ever been an attempt to put the affirmative action in statute? Well, that's Title Seven. Uh, that's the Civil Rights Act. You're, you're correct. In the 1960s, uh, the Civil Rights Act was passed, uh, which really uh, took the, the guarantees granted by the 14th Amendment and applied them to not only the states, which is what the Constitution does, but also to all institutions 
which receive federal funds of any sort of kind. So uh, the Title VII law now extends down to employers uh, and extends to organizations, whether they be uh, community organizations, civic organizations, things of that nature. We have uh, attempted to uh, extend that kind of uh, protection against unlawful discrimination beyond what the 14th Amendment as was providing up until that point in time. So the affirmative action as addressed by the Supreme Court yesterday uh, was not covered by Title VII? No. In fact, the, the Supreme Court decision yesterday uh, was decided both on 14th Amendment grounds and Title VII, and it was because of the distinction between the two uh, universities involved. North Carolina, of course, is a state institution, uh, and get, receive state funding and federal funding. Harvard is a private institution, yet it still receives federal funding, of course, federal grants for research and things of that nature. So the way to reach Harvard was through Title VII analysis, but the way to, way to reach North Carolina was through the 14th Amendment analysis. And that's why both that constitutional provision and the uh, legislative enactments were central to the decision yesterday. Jason Barrett. Joe, I know this is, you, you mentioned this is going to be your topic for the panel, so I don't want to delve too much into to your personal opinion, but but I would like, um, you know, your reaction to um, some of the folks that, that disagree with this opinion. Um, and it seems to me that, that they're making this case that um, that African Americans can't compete in a merit-based system, that um, that the affirmative action uh, is what is uh, permitting and giving special treatment uh, to the African American community to get into these institutions. Doesn't that send a message that they can't compete in a merit-based system? Well, that is, uh, in fact, what Justice Thomas argued in his concurrence was that the uh, uh, up until this point in time, racial preferences for college admission were stigmatizing and, and were basically a message to the black community that, uh, yeah, you, you know, you need special accommodations in order to compete in, in this race uh, uh, for life. And, and I think that uh, that holds true to a lot of folks, uh, certainly those who have been critical of affirmative action over the years. And there's been this recognition, Jason, that when you grant preferences to one group, others suffer. And the, the, uh, one of the main litigants in this case that was decided yesterday was a group of Asian American students who statistically were able to show that their admissions to Harvard, the numbers uh, of folks who were admitted from that community, suffered as a result of racial preferences being granted to others. And so when you take away from one and grant to another, you, you know, there, there's, uh, there's certainly a give and take there that uh, other folks can, can argue we've been uh, adversely affected by the, uh, the process. Personally, I, I, I struggle with this because, uh, look, this country has a long history of accommodating and, and affirmatively providing uh, preferences to certain groups of people. That's why we have an American Disabilities Act law. Uh, that's why we have other laws uh, towards uh, gender equality. Uh, we, we've been attempting to assimilate all people into society and give everyone a chance to uh, succeed. And there has been a recognition uh, for a long time that, as I indicated in my, in my analogy, when we're at the 100-yard line dash of life, we all don't start with the same advantages we don't have the same training to get to that race we don't we can't afford to buy the best shoes or the best wind resistant clothing uh, and there's a recognition that we run that race certain people are going to be uh, affected by that aspects of it and and I, I think that the uh, affirmative action was an attempt noble uh, though it was to remedy some of those problems that we uh, that we know exist and still exist today but sure. Uh, the, the, the struggle I have is that it does adversely affect others. Joe, uh, we tend to think of affirmative action in this case as college universities. Uh, 
Tom, Judge Thomas has been a very has been a severe critic of affirmative action for many many years. Uh, even though he acknowledges he got into Yale University due to affirmative action, but according to what I've read recently, Judge Thomas feels that uh, he uh, in the road of life, as you've described it, he was at a disadvantage because of that. He, he got he got into uh, Yale, what some folks viewed as preferential treatment, then he graduated from Yale, and then he had to overcome the stigma of preferential treatment, and he felt he was at a disadvantage. Uh, uh, that's supposedly some of his logic. Uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I think that, and that's what's fascinating and why I recommend reading his concurrence, because he does have a unique perspective on this, uh, it, where he benefits from affirmative action, and you're correct. He, his admission into Yale, he, he readily admits, was a part of that program at, at Yale University. Uh, however, his experience while in Yale and in his young professional life was one of, of a, a, a stigma where people looked at him and said, well, you wouldn't be here but for this or but for that. Uh, in other words, ev everything that he might have achieved up to that point in time was not really based on merit, but was based on the fact that he had legal preferences uh, that he benefited from. And, and again, the, the backlash to all this is, is, is people wondering, well, who didn't get into Yale, who, who had the record of merit and achievement in order to carve out a place for Justice Thomas? And, and he, he writes – eloquently about that and, and I, I respect that he's coming from that perspective i think it is an important one to understand joe the supreme court carved out an exemption for the military yesterday and part of their decision do you understand the reasoning behind that no i do not it, it makes no sense to me uh, uh and justice uh uh, uh i'm sorry the name escapes me now the chief justice indicated that uh, for whatever reason, and he doesn't give the reasons, uh, diversity is, is still valued and necessary in our military academies, I understand, educational institutions like West Point and Annapolis, uh, and in our, our, our uh, service uh, people, you know, that they, we have to have diversity in some of these uh, um, uh, in the military, and he doesn't explain why, but it says it, it, it's you know for almost like it's obvious that we still have to have those kind of preferences granted. Um, why that's important in the military and not in our other educational institutions, not in our corporate boards or our, uh, our you know corporations that run the country and, and, and employ tens of thousands of people, uh, he does not explain. And it kind of uh, uh, really weakens his argument overall. Now, I'm glad he did it because I tend to agree that diversity in our armed services is very important. But the underlying rationale for that seems to uh, run counter to his overall argument that it's time to end affirmative action. I was confused by it myself because conservatives generally are the leaders in complaining that the military is not the place to conduct social experiments. Bill? Yeah, I, I got just the opposite read of what you did, Joe. I thought Roberts was saying that uh, due to affirmative action, the military has gone from then non-diverse, if you will, to probably one of the most diverse organizations we have as far as senior leadership. Uh, prior to uh, the last few years, there were very few blacks and minorities in senior leadership. Now it is well, well diverse. And he's saying that was a, uh, that can be contributed to affirmative action. And uh, so he was given, he was given uh, uh, some acknowledgement that at least in terms of the military, the officer rank, it ha it did work. So, so, yeah, so why would that well, not apply I, I to the general population? I, I don't, well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Bill. I don't, I don't disagree with anything you've just said, but my, my point is that if the rationale for this decision is that we, we are essentially now a colorblind society and we don't uh, any we don't require these preferences any longer, why is that true in general but not with the military, which, as you say, has been uh, greatly diversified? 
And, and so haven't we achieved what we wanted to achieve through this law? And isn't a, if that noble purpose exists, that diversity is the key for, the, for society, why would you continue it in one aspect of it and not the other? That's where I have trouble with his rationale. Jason. Joe, did the dissenting opinion uh, reference this military carve-out at all? Uh, it, I have not read it completely, Jason, so I can't answer your question. I have to believe that – and I believe it was Sotomayor who, uh, in, in a bit of a fit, uh, because justices only do this when they're angered, uh, she read her dissent. Uh, yesterday in open court, and I think she referenced the fact that not only did uh, the Chief Justice carve out an exception to the military, but he also left the door slightly ajar for universities in their admissions processes to still consider race, albeit in the context of, you know, reviewing an essay from an applicant who will who would explain how they overcame the ravages of racial discrimination in their life or, or, or how race played an important part in making them the person they are uh, at the time of their application. Uh, he in- encouraged universities to still do that, but basically put down the gauntlet and said, but you shall not make your final admissions decisions based on race as a preferential aspect of the application. I mean, do you see any type of reason why uh, the, uh, the Chief Justice would want the door left open for um, a- another case to come before the court um, to address the military carve-out? I mean, don't, don't you see that in the future as there's going to be another case that, that says affirmative action has no place in the military as well? Oh, oh yeah, I, I, I think you're correct, and I think there will be other litigation that's going to be coming before the courts uh, I expect a lot of cases to be filed here in the next few years as the schools themselves and the military continue to adjust to the import of this decision. Uh, You know, clearly we have a Supreme Court, which is now indicating that uh, in some respects we have achieved a level of diversity that no longer requires legal preferences be granted uh, to certain Uh, minority communities. And and I think that uh, uh, whether or not that is true uh, is going to be something that is going to be the question that's litigated going forward. And how these universities are going to respond to this, Jason, uh, look, universities, and and they did it with with, uh, women in society for a long time. You know, we've come a long way with, with women's rights. You know, when I grew up, and I first started working in a law firm. It was a, a, a tradition to, at our annual gathering, to toast the women of the law firm because they, by and large, were at home and, and homekeepers and, and housewives and taking care of the kids. Uh, that law firm today is probably 50% female, and that's because, in part, universities encouraged women applicants to go to law, go to engineering. Uh, go to the medical field. Uh, And so there was an affirmative action, uh, though not legally imposed, there was affirmative action at the university level when it came to gender. And I suspect that universities will continue to look at race as an important aspect of their admissions process. They're just going to do it by different methods. Uh, They may look at, uh, uh, hey, we want a certain number of kids from this zip code which might be a, a predominantly black community, or we might want applicants from uh, we, we want applicants from every school who are at the top of their class. Now, some of those schools are going to be predominantly African American schools, and the university is going to take them because they're at the top of the class. So there'll be, still be ways for them to achieve diversity. It just won't be as overt as it has been under 50 years of precedent. Joe, there was a second decision yesterday, and uh, this one had to deal with religious freedom and uh, websites. Uh, We don't have a lot of time. Could you give us a quick summary of that one? Yeah, Grofton versus DeJoy uh, was the case involving the uh, U.S. mailman who refused to work Sundays. We know that the U.S. Postal Service now has a contract with Amazon uh, to deliver Amazon packages on Sundays. A lot of U.S. mail carriers now work on Sundays. 
But this individual said, hey, that's, you know, against my religious beliefs. I keep the Sabbath day holy. I want to spend it with my family. I don't want to work. And uh, the case came out. It was a 9-0 decision, and which uh, indicated, by the way, it's going to go back to the, uh, to the state court for a further development. But the Supreme Court basically said that an employer for an initiative, for an employer to take action against someone who refuses to work on a Sunday or, or other aspects of the job based on religious reasons, the employer is now required to show that there is a significant financial burden or harm to the business that uh, would be at the basis of its policy to require uh, an individual to work in violation of, of his or her religious beliefs. So the standard is the employer has to sh show a significant impact before they can enforce a workplace rule that might impact someone's religious beliefs. And there was a second one, Joe, regarding a, a person who did not want to do websites for a gay couple. Yeah, that hasn't been decided yet. That's in Colorado. Uh, this young lady who designs websites has, up until this point in time, said, I'm not designing any websites for uh, members of the LBGTQ plus community. And, uh, uh, so if they if these businesses are, are run by members of that community, uh, this individual does not want to do their website. That case is going to be decided. I think it's going to be released today, and uh, it's widely expected to be in favor of the individual who uh, is refusing to do that website work. And there's another decision today about student loan forgiveness. Yeah, uh, and that also is expected to be uh, – uh, a case where the Biden administration loses. It's the Biden loan forgiveness program. Uh, uh, the argument was that that was uh, uh, unconstitutional and an overreach of executive power. Uh, the Supreme Court is, again, widely expected to cut back on that uh, exercise of executive power. Yeah, Joe, going back to the post, uh, postal carrier, uh, does that not blur the distinction between uh, separating between church and state? Well, that's the argument, Bill. Uh, but recall, uh, it wasn't just about a year ago where that uh, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District case from the state of Washington, where the football coach was praying after a football game at the 50-yard line. Uh, Justice Gorsuch, uh, in his uh, majority opinion, indicated that uh, that's uh, freedom of religion, which is guaranteed under the First Amendment. And as long as it is not creating a, a, an undue hardship to the school district, or infringing on other people's rights, the, the college or the high school football coach should be permitted to do that. Uh, and in this particular case, again, it's another uh, victory for religious freedom. Uh, again, so long as the employer uh, is unable to show a significant harm or impact to the business, an individual can refuse to work on Sunday, or, uh, or, or you know, another aspect of, of a religious belief, if uh, if the workplace rule impacts that. Uh, uh, that impact it has that impact on the individual's religious practices. Joe, good stuff as always, man. Yeah, appreciate it, Rob. I look forward to uh, talking a little bit more about affirmative action here in a few minutes. Yeah, take a breath. You are our leadoff hitter, so relax during the break. <laughs> yeah. get, a, get a massage. It's uh, eight thirty-four. We stop here to take a timeout. We'll